Welcome to episode 196 of the Sisters in Loss podcast. April is Sisters in Loss and Fertility Awareness Month. All month long, we will be highlighting infertility journeys and stories. Approximately 20% of couples struggling to get pregnant are told that they have unexplained infertility. After examinations and tests, the doctor states there is no known medical reason to explain why they haven't conceived. Today's guest has been diagnosed with unexplained infertility after three miscarriages, one atopic pregnancy, failed clomid cycles, two fertility clinics, to being diagnosed with unexplained infertility. Doctors told her the only chance of her becoming a mother was through in vitro fertilization or IVF. Sophia Campbell's journey to motherhood required her unlearning past hurts and traumas and conquering infertility by faith to have her miracle daughter. And thus, in today's episode, Sophia shares her journey to taking back control of her life after loss and how she's on the mission to remove the stigma to provide the education for women to feel supported and to process the roller coaster of emotions, guilt, shame, fear, anger, frustration, and to provide a safe space and community for women to share more and learn from each other. Today's episode is for you to listen to if you've ever been diagnosed with unexplained infertility. Today's episode is for you to listen to if you want encouragement to fearlessly go after your dream of becoming a mom. Listen to Sophia Campbell. All right. Welcome, Sophia, to the podcast. Thank you, Erica. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so I would like for you to share a little bit about yourself and what you do. Okay, thank you. Um, So like you said, my name is Sophia. I am a certified life coach, life slash infertility coach. I am an author of um, three journals, uh, Fertility Journal, 52 Weeks Fertility Journal, a PAR journal and a grief journal. And I'm also a co-author in the book, Healing the Little Woman Inside. Um, That was an anthology with 31 other women. Apart from that, I, I do work in project management, but my love and passion right now is helping other women who are going through, you know, who's been through miscarriage or pregnancy loss, infant loss, or infertility diagnosis. And that was because of my own journey being diagnosed with infertility, having experienced three miscarriages, and just going through that emotional roller coaster of pain, grief, and suffering in silence. Now, outside of that, I'm Jamaican by birth, and I migrated to Canada in 2008. And um, when I came to Canada, my, my, my goals were, I came as a single woman, of course, and my goal was to find myself a, a dream husband <laughs> and um, get married, have a baby, and, and um, have a happy home. And I did find my dream husband. I, I, I got married within the first year of moving to Canada. And I was already 35 years old, so I wanted to start trying for a baby right away. (laughs) Age, in my mind, you know, was not on my side. And so we started trying right away for a baby. And um, that's why I'm here. The journey I thought that would, would be short and happen right away just did not happen. Um until a very long time. It took a very long time to 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 conceive and what I thought was just having sex, unprotected sex, getting pregnant, have a baby after nine months was not the case for us. Yeah. So take us back on that journey and share with us um, your miscarriage and your infertility journey as a whole. So like I said, we started trying in at the end of 2009, after we got married and after the first six months, and I didn't get the first six months and testing pretty much every month and hoping to get a 
positive pregnancy test, that did not happen. And so I was becoming more and more frustrated after month two, month three. Month six is when I decided, you know, me and my husband decided we needed to talk to a doctor to see what's going on. Because by that time, I thought something was wrong with me or something was wrong with him, you know. So we went and we saw our doctor and he pretty much just, um, he casually <laughs> sent us back, back home to say, this is common, you know, this is not a rare thing to you guys. It's common and couples pretty much um, try up to a year and it's at that one year mark. If you're not pregnant, then I, as a doctor, typically have that conversation with my parents. So he casually sent us back home to go and keep trying for a year. And if nothing happened, we were to come back. And so we went home, disappointed, of course, but still kept busy <laughs> um, with our sex life. Pretty much we were on the clock. Like every month I'd just wait for my 28 days, wait to overlay, to have sex, to test. So everything became so robotic. <laughs> And at the one year I went back, we went back to see the doctor and he referred us to a fertility clinic. And um, my first appointment at the fertility clinic was mostly around consultation for me and my husband, a lot of um, blood work, questions on our past history. And right after that first consultation with a doctor, I had a vacation to Jamaica and I went. After being in Jamaica for a couple of days, I began <laughs> to feel sick, you know, but pregnancy was the farthest thing from my mind then. And I guess because I was seeing a fertility specialist, I already created the story in my mind that there's no way I was going to become pregnant naturally after trying for a year. And I was already looking down the road of um, fertility treatment. So pregnancy was the farthest thing from my mind, you know. And so once I came back home to Canada and I noticed I didn't have my, my, my period. And so I just said, let me do a test. And I was still not feeling myself. I did a test and realized, oh, <laughs> oops, we're pregnant. I remember calling the fertility specialist right away to say, we're not going to come back for a follow-up um, appointment meant because I'm pregnant at this stage because the first appointment we went to we did have a follow-up after all the um, blood work that we did we were supposed to go back to get all the test results right and so I remember calling to say um, we're pregnant so we will not be coming for our next appointment to get the results of our blood test because why would we go back we're already pregnant and um, I remember the nurse saying yes but still come in so we can confirm your pregnancy and um, refer you back to your general practitioner. So we waited on the next appointment and it was right. I was, I think I was around six weeks based on when I had tested. I was around the six week mark and getting ready to, to the, that same week to go back to see the fertility specialist. And I was home in the kitchen cooking one Sunday and I just felt the sharp pain in my tummy. <laughs> and the only place that I could think of running to was the bathroom based on the pain. It was excruciating. My husband, I think he was in the living room watching TV. I didn't say anything to him. I just ran to the bathroom. And the pain was so sharp. It was so severe <laughs> that I literally um, curled up in the bathroom on the floor. and try to get my husband, try to call him, but I don't know what happened. I totally blocked out. And I think he, um, he probably realized that something was going on, came to the bathroom and I told him I was in pain and he put me on the, on the toilet. This is probably graphic. <laughs> he, he, he put me on the toilet and I just sat there. And the next thing I know, I felt like I passed something in the toilet and the pain somewhat subsided and when I looked in I just saw this ball of blood and to me the first thing I thought I was losing my baby I had no idea what to do this was new to me and my husband at that point asked if he should call 911 
And I said to him, I think I can make it to the ER because by this time the pain had somewhat subsided. And that's what we did. We went to the emergency room and, and it was at that time that the doctor confirmed that I was having an early miscarriage. And they did all the ultrasounds just to check. And they confirmed there was no baby, the sac was there, but there was no baby, no indication of a baby in the sac. And um, if I wanted to do a DNC, I had the option to either wait it out to have a natural um, miscarriage or to do a DNC. As a new pregnant woman, I was confused. I had no option what to choose. And I just said, I'll wait it out to have a natural um, miscarriage. And so we didn't end up doing the DNC that day. It's kind of a blur. I don't remember what they did, but of course we went back home. I believe they, they, they instructed us that they would have sent the report over to my um, fertility specialist with what happened and stuff, and which they did because I remember by the Monday, I got a call to come in and see the fertility specialist. That was the first part of the miscarriage story. So what happened after um, that first miscarriage? Did you go back into the fertility specialist? What were the next steps that happened? So, yes, we did. We went back to the fertility specialist and um, he ordered more, more blood tests, which did show that my HCG numbers were supposed to be going down, but they were not. They were actually increasing, right? And it just led to a lot more confusion for me and my husband because the way they had explained it was because you're having an early miscarriage, your HCG numbers, which are supposed to double every other day, with a miscarriage, they should be going in the opposite direction. They should be going down, but they're not. And so he ordered more. Um, blood work for every other day to come in and test to check the HCG numbers and um and one day they would go down and at the next exam or ultrasound result or blood work they would double and so at that point I had a lot of question around um am I seeing the right specialist why is it so confusing why does my body feel like I'm still pregnant if they said, um, I'm having a natural miscarriage, I've already lost um, the baby, the sack is empty. I had a lot more questions about, you know, experience and expertise with my fertility specialist. And the option he gave us was after a couple more blood work, if my number was not going down, then I would have to go back to the emergency room. But this time he would do the actual ultrasounds and tests and stuff to see what was going on. And um, if my body wasn't going back to normal within a given period, then I would have to get injections or methotrexate, I believe it was, to, to, to help my body to get rid of. I believe he said sometimes women who have miscarriage, their bodies don't get rid of the whole pregnancy, there are remnants <laughs> remaining in your, in your body. And that was a cause of my HCG numbers going up or down. So in this case, he would have to either do the injection or do a DNC. So anyway, after multiple checks and stuff, the verdict was that I had an ectopic pregnancy. <laughs> and that's why my numbers kept fluctuating because the pregnancy was outside <laughs> of the sac. And um, I had to go in, get the meth methotrexate injections, and then my body began to respond the way it should. And so that happened, and it was disappointing. It was nerve-wracking. My whole body took about four or five months before my HCG numbers went back to zero. It was difficult. Um, you know, having conversations with friends and family, because we were so excited when we found out we were pregnant, I had already gone ahead and told my parents, my husband's parents, my close friends, and a few other friends. And now I had to undo all of that 
excitement and people who were celebrating, you know, the pregnancy. So it was very disappointing and just going through the process of getting my body back to to normal so we could try again was exhausting and left me with a lot more questions because all this was new to me. But they reassured us that as soon as my body went back to to normal, my HCG level went to zero, that we could start trying again. And that's what we did. But I also, because of the questions I had, and I didn't necessarily have all faith and trust in my fertility specialist, I went to another clinic. I asked to be transferred to another fertility clinic. And the moment I walked in, I felt at home and like, yeah, this is a place that I be, I, I, I should be. The information, the resources was just amazing. The support, the way they communicated with me and, um, and my husband, he felt a lot more safe because he had a lot of reservations about going to the fertility clinic. But anyway, we went to the fertility clinic, started trying again. I had to go in every other day to do my blood test. They were monitoring me, um, like to let me know when is the best time to, 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 to have sex. Um, to get pregnant again. And I did. I did get pregnant a year after, after the first miscarriage, but that also ended in another miscarriage. But it was not an ectopic pregnancy. I That pregnancy lasted for seven weeks. I had a natural um, miscarriage. My body went back to normal pretty quickly. Like my HCG levels went to zero pretty quickly. In 2012, I had two other pregnancies, but they both ended around the seven, eight week mark. And by that time, I had pretty much um, given up on trying to get pregnant naturally and to have a healthy pregnancy. And I, I decided to engage in the conversation with my specialist on our next step. And um, we were, we were referred to trying Clomid, three rounds of Clomid, and if that didn't work, then we'd have to to go look at IUI or IVF. And so that's where we were after pregnancy number three. After pregnancy and miscarriage number three, our next step was IVF, because by that time I had decided that my body was broken. <laughs> There's something either wrong with me and my husband, why we are not able to keep a healthy pregnancy. And after all the tests that we did at the fertility clinic, the only diagnosis we had was unexplained infertility, which left me with, um, okay, there's no valid reason found why we're not able to keep a healthy pregnancy. So therefore, we just have to move on to IVF. We're tired, we're frustrated. Um, This has been my whole life for four years. Now I'm ready to move on either to the next step or to just give my body and myself, my mind a break. And so that's where we were. Wow. So how, through each of those losses that you experienced, the atopic and the other miscarriages, really, how did you grieve and up until the point that you were ready to try through IVF, which is a whole nother strenuous and mentally exhausting process in of itself? To be honest, the first pregnancy was, that's the only pregnancy at the time I, 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 I grieved. <laughs> because it was so, that baby was so wanted. We waited so long then to get pregnant, then to have it taken away. I cried (laughs) a lot every day, every night. Um, After that pregnancy and my body went back, I took one week from work. And the only person I told at work was my boss because we had, it's somebody who I knew personally um, before I start working there. And we had that type of relationship that I could say, um, I'm taking a week off from work. I just had a miscarriage. He was at my wedding, so he knew we were trying. So I, he knew when I was pregnant, he knew when I had the miscarriage. And um, he was the only person I told that I will be off for a week because I'm, I had the miscarriage. I need a week just to 
get my mind right, just to rest and get my mind right. Plus my body was still not behaving the way it should. And I did say to him, please do not tell anybody else (laughs) at work why I'm off. Just keep it to yourself. Because I struggled. I felt that I did something wrong. Um, Why I lost the pregnancy. I had to, I had a lot of friends who were, who were just rooting for us that I had to go back and tell them we lost the pregnancy. I didn't know anyone per se who had gone through miscarriages or infertility that I could talk to at the time and, you know, they could help me navigate the emotions of shame and guilt and um, fear and um, just feeling worthless as a woman. And and so there's a lot of crying and blame, (laughs) blame, blame that I put on myself, you know, and I kept telling myself different stories as well, like, like I'm too old, why did I wait so long to start trying for a baby? And so, yeah, I grieved. I, I didn't go to, I couldn't celebrate other women who were pregnant. Like once I went back to work and I saw people in the workplace with, um, who were pregnant or who would share with me that they're pregnant, I just didn't say anything to them. I'd probably just walk away from them. <laughs> I just never had it within myself to say, congratulations, I'm so excited for you. I stopped going to baby showers. And so the, the grief was, it was heavy. It was, it was heavy. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I think that a lot of people needed to hear that. It's just, it was just hard to go through life, try to get back to normal life and be around other people who just did not really know or could even comprehend what you were going through. So thank you for sharing that. So take us up to like the IVF, making the decision to go through IVF and then going through that process, which is, as I mentioned before, it's just a, it's a strenuous process as well. It's definitely a step of faith. And so once we had the conversation with, um, with a specialist about IVF, which of course is what is IVF? How does the process work? And if anybody on here had, is trying to get pregnant or has been through multiple recurrent pregnancy loss and you're desperately wanting a baby, you're always looking for that next thing. What can you do? And so even though I was tired and frustrated and my husband wanted us to just stop and rest, I was looking like researching, what is this IVF? What is the next thing? I want to do it. (laughs) You know, I'm determined to have this baby by all means, by all costs. But once we had that conversation and the cost came up, (laughs) I think that was the deciding factor for me that it's the minimum cost at the time in Canada. And what our specialist told us was $15,000 plus additional for medications, right? And so once I heard that, it was like a, wow, we just got married. (laughs) We just bought a house. We are building our relationships and to take on that heavy cost right now, we're looking at 20,000, 25,000 to take on that cost right now. Um, we'll have to think about it. And so I, I just got very depressed and, um, and um, disappointed that my next step is this, but the cost is such a major factor and I don't see myself um spending that type of money for something a baby that is not even guaranteed (laughs) and so once I left that appointment that day and got in my car I think that's the moment I said we need to take a break because this was 2013 this was four years later after trying every day that was our life and so that was a moment I said um, no, I'm going to step back, take a break, re-examine the plan, and um, maybe revisit the whole IVF situation at a later date, but not right now. 
And so the moment I got in the car, I felt relieved, like, okay, Sophie, you don't have to do this um, whole miscarriage, baby making, IVF, infertility journey today. You can come back tomorrow or at a later date, but not right now. Just take some time for yourself. And that burden, I could literally feel that burden off my shoulders, like immediately driving into work. Because all of these, I think in that moment, I realized how much stress and pressure I was putting on myself. Because all of these were appointments were happening like between 6 and 7 a.m. in the morning, every other morning on my way to work. So I would still go into work and pretend like everything was fine. And that morning I was driving to work, I always have a gospel station on in my radio and I was listening to a ministry on the radio I think it was family life ministry it's called and they were talking about um, parenting and there was a story about another woman who had a similar experience where she was trying to have a baby and it was not happening for her and she went the adoption route and she ended up um, adopting from some other country I believe it was Haiti and after she adopted into her family and found the perfect baby. She gave, you know, experiences how her life changed, but then she started having babies of her own. And I was just listening to the story and crying, like rejoicing in the car, crying at the same time. But it also gave me insight into different pathways of becoming a mom. And I started to feel that energy, invite that energy in of, if I'm not able to have a biological child, maybe I can adopt. Like for the first time, I thought about becoming a mom by some other means, adoption, fostering, and it just felt right, you know? And I listened, I started listening to the program more and more. And at that moment, I also was able to to go back to my roots and to say, Sophia, you know, what do you believe? Yes, you've been to two fertility clinics. You've listened to these doctors. You've heard the statistics about one in four women will, you know, suffer or experience miscarriage or pregnancy loss. And um, one in six infertility, like in Canada. But what do you really believe? All this time you've been you know, going around in circles, listening to doctors, listening to everybody else. And of course, you need to seek professional help. But what do you believe? What does God say about you and your circumstances? And so I just started to go back to the word, like going back to the, to the Bible and looking for scriptures and verses, like what did God say about women in the Bible who were trying to become moms, but went through great difficulties and challenges, you know, like I was going to church at the time as well. And I was on the worship team. I didn't share my, my struggles with anyone at church. And so everything became into perspective for me. Like you're running around in circles when you have all the answers, you know, what you're supposed to, to do, like tap into your faith, tap into the word, seek help and guidance from, from your community, from your church worship team, have people pray for you. And so I didn't forget about becoming a mom, but it wasn't controlling my life anymore. And um once I started sharing my story with women in the church, my worship leader, and they started to pray for me, and um, I started to seek out other communities online. At that time, I didn't know about Sisters in Loss, but I started to seek out other community of women who were not necessarily talking about pregnancy loss and miscarriage, but there were empowerment groups talking about mindset and um, how the mind is powerful and just working through the different emotions that I was going through at the time, which was self-blame, um, shame, guilt, self-love, because all of those were affected during this journey. You know, once I started to work on my self-love, my faith, my my brokenness, going back to the Bible, then I started to feel feel different about my journey and about becoming a mom. 
I absolutely love everything that you said about the church and really getting back into your faith and really finding a community that's kind of on the same path as you, you know, seeking those kind of values and motivation so that you could really press forward. Mm -hmm. So where are you now in your journey? So in 2013, the end of 2013, I think 2013 was the year I had my two other miscarriages and that's the year I decided to like all the things I describe above go back to my faith tap into support group and and share my my experience with infertility and miscarriages with 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 other groups and because I wasn't so so set on becoming pregnant I just had this this surprise, I would say a miracle um, pregnancy. And it was one day I was getting dressed to go do our photo shoot, Christmas photo shoot in November of 2013, closer to the end of 2013. Um, My clothes just was not feeling right. And my husband out of the blues, because he's always the last to remind me to do a pregnancy test. He just said, maybe you're pregnant. And I just laughed because at that time I had stopped testing every month, right? We were just living our life, enjoying each other, um, really seeing each other, building on our relationship since that was missing ever since we got pregnant. And um, he just smirked and he said, maybe you're pregnant. And I laughed and he said, do a pregnancy test. And I did it because of course, I'm never out of pregnancy tests, always have tons of them. So I did it and the lines came up. I was pregnant. And so for the first time, I was like shocked that I actually did another one and another one. And so we smiled, like looked at each other, laughed, and we went about our business to do the photo shoot just the same. In the back of my mind, I I had become accustomed to getting pregnant and having miscarriages. So I wasn't, um, I wasn't excited at the get go about the pregnancy. I just went, did the photo shoot the day. I was still being very like cautious with our positions and movements around the room and stuff. Just knowing in the back of my mind that we just got this positive pregnancy test. And with all the experience in the past of having miscarriages, then I was being cautious, but not hopeful. That was the, the, the only healthy pregnancy we had. And so my daughter was, was born in July of 2014. And we named her Faith because that's the moment I thought, that's the mo- when we decided to, to not continue with IVF. I believe it was just going back to my faith that helped us to conceive our rainbow miracle faith baby. And I never wanted to forget where we were coming from or what we had gone through to get to that healthy pregnancy. And so it's from, um, you know, going through those three miscarriages, being diagnosed with infertility, dealing with that shame, guilt, brokenness, not having or knowing a community then to tap into. It's just from that experience that I decided that no other woman that I come in contact with who has shared their story about pregnancy loss, infant loss, miscarriages, infertility, should have to suffer in silence or in shame or think that she's broken. You know, it's from that whole challenging experiences that I decided to become a life coach and to become an infertility coach to help those other women, you know, navigate the the emotions that you go through. Because even though you're, you're going through the physical, physical side of infertility or miscarriages, you know, seeing doctors getting tested, I never had that support for the emotions, like they're doing their jobs, but the emotional side, which I think is, is so devastating, it's a side that often gets missed. And so 
it's from that experiences that I decided I'm not going to sweep or brush my experience under the rug and pretend that it never happened because there's so many other women out there that are walking around like I did with so much shame and guilt. They're suffering in silence because the subject of miscarriage, the subject of um, pregnancy loss and infertility, you know, it's, it's so still so taboo. So taboo, not just with friends, but family as well. You know, I grew up in the Caribbean where it's a, it's almost like a given once you get pre once you, you get married, the next natural process is for you to have babies. And a lot of times when my family was asking, you know, what's going on with the baby, they had no idea that I was struggling. They had no idea. And I, and it's out of my own doing as well, not sharing and who to say they would blame me or judge me. I don't know, but that's the culture that I grew up in. Maybe they would be praying for me, you know, having prayer meetings for me. And so we never know how someone will support you, you know, through your journey. And so I'm here as a coach now to help those other women who are struggling to, to get pregnant and are going through, through that um, shame journey and are suffering in silence, really. Absolutely. And thank God for your miracle, because um, I love um, hearing people who really stepped out on faith and God blessed them naturally with babies, um, no different than those who do go through the journey of IVF or IUI just because it's still a faith walk either way um, and I love that you are turning your pain into purpose and serving others by way of um, coaching them through and they're navigating their challenges through fertility through um, loss um, as well as pregnancy after loss so I would love for you to share more about um, the services you offer and um, is it just for um, um, folks who are in Canada or are you open to the U.S. as well? Um, absolutely no. I'm open to the U.S. I'm open to globally, wherever in the world you are. Most of my services online, I do one-to-one -one coaching that I'm opening back in February. Um, now we're, we're, we're in a pandemic where a lot of services have gone online. So absolutely all my services are available online. I do, like I said, I do the one-to-one -one coaching. I have resources online, my journals. If you're going through infertility and you want to, to you're looking for a resource or a tool that can help you as you walk through your difficult journey. Of course, journaling was one of the tools that I used to really dump all the feelings and emotions that I was carrying inside, you know, when I couldn't um, share it with anyone. I used to write it down, um, how I'm feeling, and really, you know, feel those feels by just reading them over and trying to, to, to change, the, change the mindset. And Oftentimes, I would go back and look at my journal to see where I started and where, 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 how my mind transformed and transitioned over time, you know, from the negative things I was telling myself to, you know, the positive thoughts and feelings and emotions that came out over time. And so that's available online as well through my Instagram page, Sophia Campbell Inspires. If you go to the link there, my journal is there. You can tap and um, purchase. There's also free resources there as well. I do have a grief journal as well because we all, our, if somebody's on your podcast listening and you're going through infertility or miscarriage, pregnancy loss, and you're questioning yourself, just know that your grief is valid and um, don't let anyone hurry up your grief. Just grieve as long as you feel the need to. Um, acknowledge where you are in your grief, the stage that you're at. Just acknowledge it, write it down, and um, just know that it's valid and it's okay. It's okay to grieve, you know, not just the loss, but all the the the, the, the things that the hopes that came with the loss that 
you know, are no longer there, just write them down in your grief journal and hold them dear to your heart. And um, when the time is right, you also know that God will, his, his plans and his timing is right. So just know that he has a plan and a purpose for your life. I also have the prior journal, faith, family, fruitfulness, prior journal can be accessed through my um, Instagram page as well. And like I said, those are some of the resources that help me on my journey. I also do vision boards. There's a vision board course on my website that you can access through going to my webpage, sophiacampbellinspires.com. Um, create a vision board for yourself, you know, put those babies on the board that you are attracting into your life. That's one of the other resource that helped me on my journey. And so you can access that on the website as well. I'm also on Facebook, sophiacampbellinspires.com. Awesome. So um, what encouraging words can you leave with our listeners, those who are going through um, the journey of loss or infertility? If you're here and you're journeying through infertility or miscarriage, pregnancy loss, um, just know that I, I see you, you know, I see your pain. I see your, all the, the, the brokenness that you're telling yourself that your body is broken. If you're carrying shame, blame, thinking that it's your fault, like me who was telling myself that I'm too old. Um, you may be saying that this is a sin of the father. Um, you're not broken, you know, remember that you are perfectly and wonderfully made. Um, you deserve to be a mom. God's plan is, is perfect. His timing is perfect. I know as women, as couples, we tend to, to, to plan, want to plan our life, put a time to it. But God's plan, they're always perfect. His timing is always right. Um, cry as much as you want, but also, you know, tap into your faith and pick yourself up and, um, and love on yourself. Love on yourself. If you suffered a loss, um, name that baby. That's something that I didn't do. I only did that last year. October during pregnancy and infant loss month. And it was so, it made me really somehow brought my grief home that that was a baby, that was a life that I was carrying. And it doesn't matter how, whether it was the first trimester, the second trimester, third trimester, or if your baby was here and you lost it after your baby, that life was valid. And um, just name that baby and find a way to honor that baby. Light a candle, maybe you know, once a month or once a quarter and just hold those memories dear to your heart and affirm that God's timing is perfect again and you will be blessed more than any other people. And like God said in his word, Deuteronomy 7, 14, none of his men or women will be childless without a baby, nor will any of his livestock be without young. Deuteronomy 7, 14, that was one of my go-to verses in the Bible and um, also Genesis 21 to at exactly the time God said it would happen Sarah became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abram even in his old age and I often um, remember especially that verse because one of the things I was saying to myself is that I was too old at 35 or 36 I had my baby at 40. Sarah had her baby at an old age, I believe 90 plus. So at exactly the time God said it would happen, it will happen for you. And just remember with God, everything is possible. What's impossible with man is possible with God. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Sophia, for being on the podcast. I have enjoyed and I know that all the listeners have been blessed. Thank you so much for having me, Erica. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. There are so many ways to connect with the Sisters in Loss community. 
join our monthly support group, our Sisters in Lost Healing Collective at sistersinlosthealing.com. Join our free Facebook group at sistersinlost.com forward slash community or text sisters to 797979 to download your free journal to healing ebook. That is sisters to 797979 to download your free journal to healing ebook. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Sisters in Loss and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah, girl, we on YouTube at Sisters in Loss TV. We love you for listening. Keep the faith. Until next time, this is Erica and I'll talk to you soon.